Okay. Uh, okay. Hello, everybody. Um, one quick thing. Uh, we're going to pass around this box in the audience. Uh, it holds like paper snippets, and I would please ask everyone who gets the box in his hands to take out one of these pieces of paper and keep them for later on. Thanks. <laughs> we're we're going we're gonna to sure. resolve what this is about in a bit. So, uh, yes, my name is Daniel Schmidt. This is Julian Assange. Um, we're here to make a short presentation about the WikiLeaks project. Um, we have three major sections that we would want to talk about. Uh, we assume that most people have heard about what we're doing by now, so we don't want to focus too much on all the stuff that has happened, but rather talk a bit about what will happen in the future. So after a short introduction, we'll be talking about the next generation um, and some other things that are important. Uh, so uh, for those of you who have not been uh, too familiar with our work yet, um, we are a platform that is, as we have been introduced, that is disclosing information that is in the interest of uh, the general public, um, no matter if this information was supposed to be disclosed or not. Um, we accept classified or restricted material only, or material that is otherwise legally threatened um, in its publication. Uh, we have an anonymous uh, safe harbor, so we accept these documents anonymously. Um, we have very strong mechanisms to protect the sources that we have, and we provide mechanisms by which we can provide these documents um, un on an uncensorable way. So we are making sure that everyone gets access, no matter who is trying to suppress the material. Uh, we're doing this for various reasons. These are all documents that we publish, and all of these documents are part of all our historic record. So this might sound a bit abstract as we're all not historians, but we believe that our historic record is the only guidebook that we have. So the only way how we can determine um, what a uh, what a certain development for the future will bring is by looking at our history. So it is very, very important, and uh, we hope we can all agree on that, um, to preserve our historic record as detailed and as accurate as possible, especially in those cases where people are trying to suppress detail. Uh, according to the National, which is something that we are kind of proud, um, it's one of the last quotes we had, so the National has said that we have produced more scoops in our short existence than the Washington Post in the last 30 years. Um, <laughs> thanks. We're just at the beginning though, so... <laughs> We're just getting warm. That's partly of what we're going to talk about. Um, do you want to give a short overview of the stuff we had, we had so far? <coughs> so when we were putting this together, uh, Daniel and I, uh, earlier today, <laughs> um, <laughs> we were like, OK, we've, what have we done? OK, we've done this and this and this and this this year, uh, compared to Congress last year, where we spoke. Um, but. Then I looked at Daniel and said, actually, that's just what we've done in the past two months. Um, what actually have we done in the rest of the year? God, I don't know. My head's so full of stuff. So we'll look on Wikipedia. And well, it, it, <laughs> it, not, not the German version, though. Not just the German to have that. <laughs> As bad as it is, but we have these disputes about content that is relevant or not as well, which is really a shame for any kind of encyclopedia. Yes. Actually, the... Well, I'll get on to okay. it. Okay. Well, I just wanted to have that said. So, there, uh, we don't want to rest on our laurels, of course, and I think we have about a thousand times more work to do uh, than what we have done, literally. Um, however, uh, there is just too much to talk about if we go for the whole year. And uh, so, really, we are just going to speak about what's been happening in the last few months. And I hope you, are, if you're more interested, you can look at some other things that have happened earlier uh, in the year. But it's all uh, similar material. Uh, so, something that happened, maybe some of you have heard about, is this Trafigura incident. So, Trafigura is a multinational commodities trader. It's the third largest uh, in the world. Approximately, it's very hard to find out with these companies actually because they diversify the asset holdings through whole lots of front companies all over the world, so it's hard to know. Anyway, it claims it's about one of the third largest. Uh, it dumped in 2006 uh, toxic waste 
sludge from a very cheap oil refining process that it did on board a ship uh, in the Ivory Coast. Now, it tried to send that into Amsterdam and was not able to. Um, Amsterdam said that it would take about uh, 864 euros per metric ton to process. So instead they thought, okay, we'll set up, uh, I have to be careful about this, a uh, company was set up in the Ivory Coast shortly after that uh, to take uh, this uh, toxic waste sludge and it was dumped around um, towns in the Ivory Coast and according to a UN report from September uh, drove 108,000 people uh, into hospital. Do you have an export? Yes. Um, yeah. So this is kind of a stereotype of exploitation that we have exposed and the worst thing about it is that it's going on and on and on. So these people are filing lawsuits against all newspapers in the UK and they're trying to suppress anything that comes to light about all these people that got sick in the Ivory Coast. So yeah, we, um, this, this was front page of the Guardian a couple of times um, and uh, UK Parliament itself was in the pro process of, of being censored by Trafigura. The Guardian couldn't, couldn't report this. But we ended up having to get an MP in the British Parliament to read out the WikiLeaks URL of the secret report, including the colons and slashes and everything. Um, to get it into the public record. That did get into public record, but, uh, and was quite well known for, for, a, for a period uh, a month ago, but it's going on. So just uh, two weeks ago, the BBC uh, removed its uh, uh, investigative report, uh, both the MP3 recording from BBC World Service and uh, Newsnight and their article. Uh, the Times has removed its content. Uh, the London Independent has removed its content. Uh, so this doesn't stop. There uh, has been no uh, entire victory of speech in the UK, but we still have yes. the material. We're trying to mirror everything that gets removed from some other place. So, yes, another thing, uh, we, most of the Germans here might be more familiar with this. Uh, we published a large quantity of the toll collect contracts. Um, so this is a billing system for heavy vehicles driving on the German autobahns. Um, it's a secret contract between a consortium operating this and uh, the German government. Um, we got a hold of 10,000 um, of around 17,000 pages um, in total. We published this. Uh, we are still waiting for the other 7,000 to turn up. Um, whoever got uh, is standing in a bad light after the first 10,000 might have an interest to set the record straight. Um, also, just to make that a public record, we would like to ask the German government to come up with counterproof. Um, there have been a lot of claims in the news media here in Germany saying that the numbers that were published, um, the investigation that was done on these 10,000 pages is wrong, that the Stern magazine, for example, published um, a wrong uh, analysis of it, um, wrong numbers. Um, we are still waiting for counterproof, so we're not taking up some shallow statements. Um, I guess the only way that uh, we can have a factual discussion is by disclosing this contract completely. So before that, I guess it's all speculation and we just don't have to listen. Yes, uh, another second one, pretty popular in Germany, hopefully, uh, because that is a very important topic, is uh, the Kundus report, um, the Feldjäger report, so to say. Um, it's a report done by the German military, 40 pages long. It's uh, classified. Um, it was done in an, as an investigation or part of an investigation into an, a bombing incident in Afghanistan, in Kundus, um, a bombing incident that was ordered by German military. So it is German military that is, uh, that is responsible for um, the carrying out of a bombing where civilians have died. Um, from how much I understand German law, this is not in harmony with our constitution. Uh, that is something, uh, it's a real problem. Uh, it's the story of a country that is in a military peace mission. And everyone in Germany, all the politicians, um, newspapers have discussed this at length, um, are avoiding to talk that, about the fact that we are in a war. Um, they are saying it's just a peace mission. But this is the first time that we have proof that on order of German military, uh, civilians have died, so we are actively in combat in Afghanistan, and it's about time that the German public starts to talk about this in the way that it deserves to be talked about. Because <laughs> Thank you.
This is a decision that all of us, all of us Germans have to take. The question is, do we want to be part of this or not? And we have to have all the facts to make this decision. And uh, therefore, we can just urge whoever, for example, has the NATO report on this, um, maybe someone's listening or maybe someone in the audience know someone, there are other reports that would be very, very helpful to get a full picture of this and to put more pressure on those people responsible for what has happened down there. Yes, um, the 9-11. So, <coughs> some of you may have heard of this uh, recently. Uh, we released uh, over 500,000 uh -huh. <laughs> uh, over 500,000 uh, text messages uh, pager messages that were intercepted between 3 a.m. New York time, September 11, and 3 a.m. New York time, uh, September 12. Uh, 2001. 2001, yes. So those messages um, uh, provide a totally objective and accurate snapshot uh, into a form of communication that was happening at that time that includes uh, a lot of messages from Secret Service, uh, it includes uh, first responders, NYPD, uh, doctors and so on. Um, but the meta context is also very interesting, that someone was intercepting the pager traffic for four major pager networks uh, in the United States before September 11, because remember this is at 3am uh, and across uh, for the rest of the day. Uh, and when we release this uh, we seem to have invented a new form of political uh, uh, demonstration or political art, which is we released this in delayed real time. So uh, we released it over a 24-hour period uh, as it happened. And this helped people understand um, some of the, the content and the, the progression in what occurred. So th those people who are interested in the 9-11 conspiracy theories Actually, you can see how all this originated. Uh, you can see um, Condoleezza Rice uh, calling off uh, aborted miss missions. You can see people talking about bombs uh, exploding or secondary explosions. Uh, you can see misreporting by the media. And you can see all this swirling around uh, and some opportunism uh, by the security state uh, later on in that day. And it seems to me that that has produced the political moment that we have now um, and this initial window um, it gives you the sense of movement that has led to this sort of defining uh, event uh, of our time. For us this was actually quite hard to release because um, so many people were interested uh, uh, in the material um, but we actually, this is, believe it or not, this is the first really significant document uh, that we've done where uh, our anonymizing network didn't go down under the load. Um, yes. Which is, we've been, uh, some of you might be aware, we called for some support because we knew that we needed to handle a lot of data, um, which is about uh, four terabytes worth of text messages. Um, it was a lot of people uh, that have been looking at these messages. Um, this is just the traffic we produced or we handled within the first few days but it gave us a feedback on how many people actually were discussing. And a lot of the people, even those people that criticized this publication, um, were still looking at it and following it over 24 hours. So even if you do not agree with, um, there's well, still actually, an interest. Actually, so we received zero complaints from anyone who had any, yeah, well, uh, zero complaints from anyone who had in fact sent a pager message. Yes, that's yeah, noteworthy. So it's, it's just like people hype up terrorism, people hype up privacy as well. So the real concerns are the people who are involved. Anyone who's involved didn't give a damn or didn't give a damn enough yes. to contact us. Yes, yeah, that's true. We, so uh, just to check, is that box still, in, still going around and everyone taking their pieces of paper? Okay, good, perfect. Um, Okay, uh, a last one from, as Julian said before, a long list that we published before, but this is something that at least to me personally is very important. Um, we published the European strategy paper from the European Institute for Security Studies. Um, those of you who have not heard about it, um, please listen. This is a paper that is done by a European think tank that deals with uh, European security policy. And these are the people that everyone in the EU listens to if it comes to these questions. And they have uh, 
worked out what we need to do to address security in Europe until 2020, so within the next 11 years. And they come to the conclusion that we have 20% globalizers in this world, which are the first world countries and transnational corporations, and we have 80% localizers. And these localizers threaten our wealth <coughs> because they are so poor and they're not happy and they're getting more and more unhappy. And this is why these people propose that we build up a European military and police unit to ca combat the poor in the world. And these people propose that we need to extract uh, uni universal goods such as the rainforest from uh, the control of the nation states they are located in. Because they say we need these re resources as well and we need to make sure that no one can get uncontrolled access to them. And they are proposing building this wall around Europe so no one can, can get in anymore, no one can swim over the sea or whatever. And this is all written in a very lengthy paper, I think 170 or 180 pages. And it's very detailed and very, very verbose. So it's a terrible read, but it shows how sick some of these people are that are planning the future of Europe. And of the society that basically anyone in this room um, will be part of. And the question that we have to ask ourselves, similar maybe to Kundus, is that with this information, do we give our silent consent? Is that like the world we imagine to live in? I guess we all know that we're exploiting the third world and that there's a lot of, that a lot of our wealth depends on this exploitation. But the question is how much further can we push out this bill or when is it time to maybe start considering how to pay that bill? What is, what is the right step? So I'm not sure if I'm maybe the only person that sees this very critical, but it's something that we thought is important to mention again. It's one of these obscure reports that are so complicated and that are sort of very technical in the way they are written that few people have a look at them and that's why a lot of Unfortunately, a lot of the information that we publish sometimes gets lost because people just don't want to read 170 pages and they don't know anything about European defense, uh, defense strategy or whatever, so they're just skipping this and go back to something uh, that's easier to comprehend. But nevertheless, this is really important and I can, as with Kundus, again only urge everyone to think about is that the world that we want to live in in the future? So Daniel just mentioned that sometimes we have uh, difficulty in people picking up material that seems to be complex. So my favourite example is um, uh, a September 2008 US Special Forces Manual on Unconventional Warfare we released, several hundred pages. Now it's written for intelligent people. Uh, it's written for uh, special forces units who go into countries and try and overthrow the government uh, of that country, or alternatively back up uh, surrogate forces, uh, paramilitaries to suppress uh, insurgencies. So US forces manual about how to create insurgencies uh, or in, uh, to suppress them. So, it reads to me like Noam Chomsky times minus one. This is not a book for fools. Uh, this is a book that talks about all the instruments of US national power. So the financial instrument of US national power, the military instrument of US national power, the intelligence instrument of US national power, the diplomatic instrument of US national power, and how all those can be brought together to a point to push a particular US policy, and talks about, yes, the IMF is a financial weapon of US national power. That's its terminology, a financial weapon. And that the, uh, the USAID is also a financial weapon. So those documents uh, do not get any media attention at all. Uh, that, that document, uh, when related to it, even talks about uh, how, despite the fact that it's uh, the Geneva Conventions say the US forces cannot wear. Uh, enemy uniforms behind governmental lines when they're doing one of these we will create our insurgency. US policy says in fact that special forces can do that, which is against international law. But actually no one seems to give a damn. Why? It's basic media economics. It's 200 and something pages. 
No one has time to read it. It has a couple of military acronyms in it, like DS for Department of State. Someone has to bother picking up a dictionary. And that tax on understanding is too high. Uh, so maybe intelligence agencies from other countries, countries that have been invaded, actually maybe take this material and use it. Uh, but it doesn't enter into the general political discourse. So we have tried to think of a way to provide incentives, sustainable incentives uh, to journalists to give them the time uh, to read the material. And <coughs> we did an experiment earlier on where we had uh, nearly 7,000 emails from Hugo Chavez's former speechwriter. And, uh, well, that's a lot of material, and we knew from, the pa knew from past experience that if we release a lot of material, no journalist will write about it. They don't have the time to look at it, and you need experienced people to write about serious things. Uh, so we decided we'd try and measure who was willing to invest the most, and we did a, an auction for exclusivity, and found that actually that was really, really hard. Um, the logistics were too hard. To, we had approaches from various people, they wanted to see some of the material uh, in, before they would work out how to pay for it, but then other people didn't want anyone to see any of the other material. Just uh, too hard. So there seems to be a natural form of exclusivity, exclusivity which we can give, which is when a journalist or media organisation, or perhaps we'll extend this to bloggers as well, uh, is involved in bringing in the material in the first place, uh, then they can have exclusivity for it for a period of time. And that allows them to invest in the material. So normally when you release something, it goes from zero supply, which has high value because we're the only ones who have it, to infinite supply. So in an economic sense, when we release a big document, it goes to zero value. And journalists can't profit from it because everyone can profit from it. Um, because everyone can profit from it, no one profits from it. Very strange and counterintuitive thing. So we've designed, a, uh, designed and designing yes. um, a system to syndicate the submissions. So every human rights organisation can stick a uh, in little embed uh, on their pages, or every media organisation, to uh, say, send this material to me via WikiLeaks. So we will then take care of shoving it through different protective jurisdictions. We will take care of um, Sanita stripping out, san yes. sanitizing and stripping out metadata. And we'll take care of the eventual legal risks that have to do with final publication. Uh, and so I think we can actually increase the volume of material we're getting that's significant by about a thousand times. But also uh, we can vastly increase the quality of secondary reporting and what we're doing. And you know, if we release material and it has no political impact, we're not doing our job. Uh, there's still some political impact for search engines, even if the press doesn't write about it. About half our, 40% of our hits are from search engines. So, but it doesn't enter into the general political discourse, so it doesn't change what people think about, think that other people are thinking. Um, okay, next. Yes, so um, the, the source, just as a little more detail, uh, the source can provide a certain time frame um, to a journalist or a newspaper to investigate into this material. Um, after this time frame is passed, we will still publish, so nothing changes about that. That is important to understand, maybe. Um, all documents are still being published in full. We are just making sure that people uh, that there is an impact maximization, so that someone picks up the material and actually writes about it. If it is being granted to a certain journalist and that journalist does not write about it, then that is a story in itself maybe as well, understanding why a certain newspaper is not picking up material that was sent to them. And that can then follow up on how good or accurate are they doing their jobs anyways. So it's going to create a lot of dynamic mechanisms that's going to make, let's say, news a little bit more interesting maybe in the future. Um, also, we can potentially scale with this submission system to providing mechanisms within governments or corporations for whistleblowing programs. There is no working whistleblowing program that we are aware of other than the one that we provide. Um, and 
we'd like to help creating this transparency within governments and corporations as well, so that an employee could use that mechanism to send something to uh, an oversight committee within his company or within the government or something similar. <coughs> Um, as Julian mentioned, we have this availability versus scarcity problem. Um, we hope to strengthen the bonds between uh, readers and the newspapers so that people who are reading a story in the newspaper and know they have a document they con could contribute to the story actually feel motivated to do so and have an, an easygoing way to, to shed more light on what the newspaper reported out about before. And that also will especially uh, scale very well with local and independent uh, media outlets. So whoever cannot really defend himself legally will profit from the system and all those people that just cannot provide the resources that we can offer with um, the infrastructure that we are running. So that, was a, um, that is one of the major features that we are working on. Uh, when we earlier uh, put together the slides, um, we realized that we are jumping a little bit from uh, topic to topic, but that is, as Julian said, just because so many things are happening and they are all kind of important that it's really hard to decide what to talk about. Um, we have one topic that we definitely need to talk about. Uh, and this is a topic that maybe fits this whole conference uh, more than anything else we can provide. Um, it's the Here Be Dragons uh, topic. Because we are going onto a very, very new territory with an experiment that we have um, tried to seed with the people of Iceland. So um, we've been to a conference at the beginning, uh, of, at the end of no November in Iceland. And uh, for those of you who don't know, um, we published the loan book of one of the largest Icelandic banks back in, what was oh, it, uh, August? August 31st. Yes. And the loan book exposed who was taking all the money out of this bank shortly before it went bankrupt. And it was really important to every single person living in Iceland in a population of 300,000 people. That's uh, such a small microcosm that everyone is affected by the bankruptcy of the banks. And everyone could have a look at this loan book and understand what insiders took all the money out of the country before all the system went down. So there were facts on the table where people could understand who had actually robbed the country and who had sent them to debt slavery for the next generations to come. So about six billion euros uh, represented uh, by that uh, loan book. And yes. Uh, two days after we released it, the national broadcaster, RUV, the, the BBC equivalent uh, of Iceland, made it their major story on the evening news. Uh, five minutes before they went to press, an injunction landed on the news desk and they couldn't say anything. First time uh, in history for Icelandic TV news. Uh, so they just said, well, we can't tell you what's in the report uh, and we have nothing else to say. Um, so we, here's the picture of the website that has the report. We'll just leave it there for the next few minutes. So a while ago, we're, every time we're meeting or talking, uh, there are some, some ideas that are coming up um, because of the things we observe. And Julian had this great idea at some point in time uh, talking to me, telling me what, what he thinks an offshore finance center is. And he, I've never thought about it in these basic terms before. So um, that is interesting or important to understand maybe. So mainly offshore finance centers exist on islands. So you find them on the British Virgin Islands or in the Cayman Islands or in these small islands near England or wherever you look. It's small places that have limited resources and that cannot compete with any major industry or whatever they could offer. So they could maybe get tourists coming to their country, but this is not really maybe as big money as attracting some of the real business. So these people, what they do, the only thing they do is they provide a specialized package of laws. And this package of laws sums up all the laws that make it attractive to you to hide your money, to bring your business registration to this place, to hide your assets there. And basically, these places have become hideouts for all the people that are exploiting this world and that are dealing in secrecy and that are... Suing us. Suing us, <laughs> yes. Most of these people are residing in these countries. So Julian said, this is, uh, why not reverse it? Uh, why not make it the other way around? So what could an offshore publication center be? Um, <laughs> Thank you.
Now, for now, it's not entirely clear if we can bring across this whole idea here within this short talk, but this is a very, very serious idea. I want to have that said. It's not just spontaneous and there's a lot of momentum behind it already and anyone who feels that what we're trying to introduce here is interesting should talk to us afterwards because we need a lot of people and there's only a small window of opportunity to do something like this. So, okay, but what is the offshore publication center? So, it would provide a specialized set of laws, same as the finance center. So, we could just say we're taking the source protection laws from, me, uh, from Sweden, for example, that exist. They are proven laws accepted by society as established in a, in, uh, in a country. We could take the First Amendment from the United States. We could take Belgium protection laws for journalists. And we could all pack these together in one bundle and Make it, a fit, make, make it fit for the first jurisdiction that offers the necessities of an information <coughs> society. Everyone in this room should understand that all of these freedoms in respect to information are really at stake at the moment. These people are upgrading all the time. They are going from nation states to Europe and it's going international and we have the ACTA stuff and whatnot and they're trying to, to get to our information on all possible ways. So we thought we just have to upgrade as well maybe and go from the defense to the attack and create something that is fit, create a Switzerland of bits. So, when Julian mentioned that for the first time, uh, we talked about this for a bit and it seemed like a very interesting thought experiment. And then we were in Iceland and when we arrived in Iceland, we found out that uh, the largest political TV show wants us as guests. It's a Sunday show that apparently almost everyone uh, work, uh, looks, watches. So we just thought, why not drop the idea on that Sunday TV show as a new business model for Iceland? <laughs> and, So we did. <laughs> and in the show, the guy sitting uh, 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 opposite to us, he was just lighting up in his face when he heard this. <laughs> and the next day, basically everyone in, Island, in Iceland wanted to talk about it. We had radio interviews, we had uh, newspaper interviews, everyone wanted to know more. We met with a press uh, union and we talked to a lot of people living in Iceland and they all see why this could be of use to them but we'll talk about why Iceland is a good place maybe in a bit. What does this mean for all of you? This is something that is uh, important to understand. Right now there is a potential to actually pull this thing off in Iceland. Uh, we have started it, lawyers in Iceland are working on a bill that will be introduced on the 26th of January. Um, <laughs> And this could provide the first counter step, the first safe haven where everyone else is trying to erode all our freedoms. So we could have the, the opposite. And there is an opportunity that we could make sure by this that all our voices are not being silenced by anyone and that all our information at least has a last resort where we could push it to. So why Iceland? Maybe that is something we need to elaborate on. <laughs> I'm glad this is getting such positive reception. Yes, no, this is important. <laughs> this reception is very important because this will need everyone's support. Yes, uh, that is true. Despite the fact that uh, we uh, have met with uh, cross-party uh, MPs, including from the government in Iceland, and there's now even uh, MPs in the Icelandic parliament uh, of 63 who wear WikiLeaks badges when they're speaking. <laughs> Uh, it, there's plenty of geopolitical incidences that could happen to derail it. So uh, it needs careful uh, planning and thought and people to not lose energy uh, or momentum. Um, so this uh, crisis in Iceland uh, in the banks resulted in a 50% uh, reduction in the, the pr price of the Icelandic currency, which was then totally frozen as a tradable currency at all. So who knows where it, it actually is. So that shock 
uh, created a quasi-revolutionary environment in Iceland. And you had, for the first time since uh, Iceland joined uh, NATO, uh, riots in the streets, and this, this is riots in the streets, Reykjavik has 200,000 people, so, um, and st a storming of parliament and a uh, change of government in April and new MPs uh, being elected. Uh, so this is a country which is also used to getting things done very quickly in a legislative sense, and that's the same reason that these offshore financial uh, havens are little countries, that you can uh, quickly get through a new package of laws because you don't have to harmonise with a whole bunch of existing laws because there just aren't a whole bunch of existing laws. And there isn't a great big lobbies in the country. Um, so yes, you could, you could probably do healthcare in Iceland in a week. Um, <laughs> not 30 years like in the US. Actually, it probably won't be done there either. Um, so, when uh, people uh, are involved in a crisis, they see um, that actually all the things that you thought were important aren't so important anymore. And the standard of what you can do, because you've seen a whole bunch of bad people, in this case, do bad things, changes. Um, and these... Uh, yes, okay. I'm being desync with the slides. Okay, so... For Iceland, uh, there's particular issues with the uh, UK, um, which is great for this issue. So the UK is the world's worst liberal democracy. It's not just the weather. It's <laughs> uh, there are right now between 200 and 300 secret gag orders in operation in the UK. So. This is according to a law firm that does work for the majority of the news organisations in the UK. Secret gag orders means uh, gag orders where you cannot speak about the fact you've been gagged. So it's, it's, you haven't just received injunctions saying you can't write, write about an oil company incident in Africa, but actually you can't write about the fact that you have been gagged from writing about an oil company incident that happened in Africa. Um, and similarly, there's uh, libel tourism is an international scandal in the UK, and New York uh, has taken out and passed through both its houses legislation to say that if there's a libel judgment in the UK on an American, well, they can't collect it in New York. Uh, it's it's that, uh, that scandalous. Similar legislation has gone through the lower house of Congress uh, last year, uh, federal Congress in the United States. Now, the Iceland really, really is unhappy with a lot of things that happened in the UK. Uh, and it had one of these libel, some of its people, media, had a libel tourism judgment against them, uh, also uh, from London courts. Um, you want to talk about the, the data centre? Yeah, well, yes, so? Yes, um, oh, okay. And there's, Iceland had the highest human development index of any country in the world. Um, and it has gone from that position uh, into, obviously, a lowered financial position. But it, it's seen the direct effects of UK bullying, IMF bullying, and actually uh, bullying from the Netherlands and, and Denmark as well. So it, the population there has been radicalised in a way that is really unthinkable uh, for the rest of modern Europe. Uh, it's, it's had a sort of Berlin Wall moment uh, in January, and the effects of that are proceeding along. Iceland will probably, is trying to enter into the EU, and um, uh, the UK is actually using that as an extortion point to get um, four years' worth of GDP paid out uh, from Iceland to the UK. Uh, so the, the moment is now to get legislation into Iceland. Because once it's in the Iceland before it's in the EU, then it will bring uh, that, those laws to the EU as a member state. Not to the whole EU, uh, but it will provide an example for others. But if uh, we wait until Iceland is in the EU, uh, then there's going to be a lot more forces uh, trying to prevent Iceland passing this sort of legislation. Yes. So, quite importantly, uh, what we also see is that Iceland is one of the first victims of the first world as well. So this is an example that we need to take very uh, 
very serious. Um, it's the first time now that the IMF, for example, so the International Monetary Fund, uh, <coughs> comes around in a first world country trying to enslave it with the same kind of conditions that third world countries get. Um, they're almost, just as an example, there almost was a bill passed in Parliament that would not have ruled out that if Iceland could not have paid their debt, that uh, someone could have taken pieces of nature and yes, so UK taken could have seized that away the from industry. the nation state. So, considering, which is another point, that Iceland has green energy in sort of an infinite supply, and they have heat and they have uh, water from the glaciers, this is a very valuable resource and it's kind of. Uh, well, obvious why this is strategically important for, let's say, um, those forces that try to harmonize everything on a global level and try to get their influences everywhere. So, green energy, yes, there's green energy and there's good cooling and there's, most of all, energy independence. So, Cheap so Yes, and, and cheap power. So right now, uh, there's an aluminium smelter run in Iceland by a US company and no one in Iceland, not a single person, wants that damn aluminium smelter. It's industry that does not belong in this beautiful green country. So they would certainly uh, be willing to give the same kind of cheap energy to data centers that do not produce the same byproducts but actually provide an example to the rest of the world that we can do it in a meaningful way, saving energy with skinless servers and good cooling and everything that is state of the art these days. So it could become um, a, more, uh, a model st um, state for the rest of the world. Um, and in a snapshot, what, what we find out the more we think about it is that a lot of pieces come together. Whether this is that Iceland has a very large public involvement in the whole political debate at the moment, so it's different from here. A lot of people really are interested in what is going on. There's a large momentum and we think that the global community by now starts to understand why their information has to be free and why we need to take more radical measures to fight against those people trying to suppress it. So what we hope for... What we, What we hope for is that we can get the international community to support Iceland from the outside. And that is where at some point in January all of your responsibility will come in. Because you will have to tell everyone in Iceland that they are doing a great thing there. And you will have to write about it and talk about it and communicate it to everyone you know that would care about the topic. Because that is one of the, the few ways that we have to tell Iceland how important this would be. And to convince those people in Iceland that did not understand it yet, I mean they have conservative parties too, um, <laughs> that this is the way to go. So that is where all of you folks might be coming in. Um, yeah, so that is, uh, in a short wrap-up, what we wanted to say uh, about Iceland, I guess. Um, we have uh, a short credit thing, so... Um, <coughs> yes, first of all, I often think maybe we should say this at the beginning of the talk, because uh, there's two of us... <coughs> there's two of us here, and then there's, of course, our lawyers and technical people and all the other people who have helped us, which, are, which I guess are hundreds. But, the real people uh, who are dear to my heart, uh, I wish I knew their phone numbers, um, is our sources. And uh, some of you, I have no doubt, are actually in this room. And I just want to say that uh, you people are, uh, are, are great um, and make me believe in humanity when I see uh, some of you people um, actually doing something worthwhile, spending a bit of energy and not being fearful. Um, yes. And maybe, may there be many more of you. Uh, and may we never... Uh, and may we never betray the trust you have put in us, either. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, also, uh, believe it or not, we want to thank the mainstream press. I, I know this must seem an anathema to some of you, but actually the people who do most of the reporting work and write, writing up of our material are mainstream journalists. 
Uh, they are professional people. Um, of course, we all know the, the debaucheries and depravities of the mainstream press, but um, working within, within that milieu, there are some very, very good people, and uh, I wish we knew how to fund them. Um, yes, yeah. so besides that, we have a lot of people that are supporting us, whether this is uh, technically or financially or the legal support we receive from all those great lawyers out there, believe it or not. Um, they're doing very important work, um, and without all these people, it would not be possible. Um, let's say 2009 has brought some, some light also on what would, what would not be possible for us and other groups um, in Germany, maybe, and this is why we'd like to thank our supporter, Morphium, uh, who is sitting in the first row here. If you want, you can stand up, and I hope everyone gives you a hand. This is a young man, and the only thing I can say... Um, If more people in this room only had half the courage that he has and would take half the legal trouble he takes for providing us with our .de domain and for providing service to the Tor project and getting endless lawsuits for that, if just more people had half this courage, then the world would be looking a little bit differently. So this is a good example out of this community that... So the question is, is courage contagious? Um, there's this famous quote, we think courage is contagious. And this is maybe how we're sliding into this last section uh, that will resolve what's this about with all these pieces of paper that you guys have. Uh, as I said, uh, or as we said, we've been to Iceland recently and we met this guy um, who's approaching us and we were thinking like, what the hell is there a Taliban guy here in Iceland? Um, <laughs> As usual, we try to get the full picture, and it started looking like this, and we realized that he's just part of the Santa Claus gang. And uh, they had come to Iceland because they heard we were there. They are just from the North Pole, and they're pretty close around. And they gave us a report. Um, it's the Christmas 2010 forecast, and uh, the report is the people performance matrix. And this is uh, the forecast that is being, uh, it's classified as secret, um, Xmas confidential and only for North Pole uh, distribution. Um, so it contains a list uh, of people that it's embargoed until next, uh, also that is important, it's embargoed until December 27th in 2010, so the next year here at this Congress. Um, and what it says is that your Xmas reward is at stake for next year because too many people are not living up to their abilities. So these people were really, really uh, concerned about this and they said that so many people have all this potential and they're not using it and they're not doing enough to fight what is happening from people that are trying to take away our liberties. Um, so that uh, they wanted to leak this report. Um, so we negotiated a, bit, a little bit and we found a solution, um, which is that you guys in this audience here, everyone who's here is kind of lucky because you can get off the list. So uh, in 2010, we will disclose a list of um, around 800 numbers um, that have not fulfilled their, uh, or have not performed. Everyone who has a piece of paper has a unique number on this piece of paper. We started, uh, a while ago, we started to give out tokens in form of a hashtag uh, to people that are supporting us. So whoever will be doing something very useful within the year 2010 can receive such a token and trade in the token with his number to get off the list. Everyone in this room has a piece of paper and you have a decision if you either throw it away and just don't care or if you take it home and think about it for the next 12 months and just do something useful. Create a new tour node and become part of the top 50 tour list and you'll get a token. Uh, do something else that's really useful. Support the fur boat, do something very creative with a chaos communication congress here or whatever. Do something that supports a community and you will be rewarded by getting off this list. For people that are doing something really useful, we will be thinking about a special reward as well that we will be giving out. So that is maybe how we'd like to, it's another try how we try um, or another 
angle that we try to take to involve every one of you, to not just stand by idly and watch, but just become active and do something that is according to what you can actually do and according to your potentials. So thanks a lot for um, the, uh, the patience and for listening. Um, I guess we're at the end of this talk. Um, we have about questions. five minutes left. If there are any questions from all those topics or whatever you always wanted to know, um, I guess that's about the time to ask. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Make sure, make sure you can all be applauding yourselves next year for not being on that list. So, any questions? Yes, Jeremy. Um, hello. Uh, first of all, uh, I want to tell you how much I admire you. Uh, you're my heroes. Uh, the project, please. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm Jeremy Zimmerman. I'm co-founder of La Quadrature du Net. And I don't say this because we, uh, as activists, make the same kind of calls very often. But you're here calling uh, people to become heroes and participate to yes. your ongoing courageous effort. What I want to do for everybody who doesn't want to become a hero or main think he doesn't have time or something like this, uh, you can also use your, your money to support. I gave a few euros, <laughs> I gave a few euros to, to Wikileaks, I gave a few euros to Wikipedia, uh, I became a member of EFF and so on. And this is something you can do that is very easy and very, very helpful. Thanks, Germany. Yes, thanks. <laughs> Yeah, thank you very much. Big respect to you guys. But this has become like a prayer meeting, so I really can't resist the urge to, to bring it down by asking you a, uh, what I hope is a difficult question. Um, I just wondered if you wanted to comment on your role in the uh, release of the hacked emails of the UEA Climate Research Centre and the following misreporting by the media, um, which as far as I've had the time to judge was misreporting. Do you have any kind of philosophy there? I don't say you shouldn't have published them, but I wonder if you're philosophical about that now. Absolutely. I wanted this to be one of the things on the list, but it would take too long to talk about. Um, those, to, to give you some background uh, for the people who weren't maybe not aware of the issue, uh, the CRU uh, is the climate, climatic research unit uh, in the UK at the University of East Anglia, and it has some of the most fam famous climate scientists in the world. His recommendations go into the IPCC, the International Panel on the International Panel on Climate Change. Okay, we released over 10 years worth of emails from the CRU and those climate scientists discussing, uh, actually they, they specialize in temperature. So is the earth getting warmer? Is it getting cooler? What are the models? What is the code? Um, uh, and the, the normal sort of debates that scientists have, political and scientific. Uh, those emails revealed, um, amongst other things, that actually these scientists had been conspiring to evade the Freedom of Information Act in the UK uh, because they were being FOI'd by climate uh, skeptics. Um, uh, evade in the sense of actually deleting stuff. Um, and they had some other motivations that some of the stuff was given to them in confidence and they wanted to preserve the confidence that they had agreed to and preserve the future relationships. But there's no doubt that there was a combined, uh, it's in my career interest, it would be bad press and I promised someone, some, a company some years ago that we probably wouldn't do that. Um, so the mainstream press uh, and in fact a, a lot of uh, internet types in the United States then went over that material, and yes, they did take 
some things out of context. So one climate scientist was speaking to another saying, um, here's a mathematical trick that we use to, etc. And so those of you involved in maths, you will know that trick just means a cool technique. It, it doesn't mean uh, anything mendacious. Um, so you're saying maybe we shouldn't have released this. Of course, we, our, our promise to our sources is get it to us if it was withheld from the public and uh, it's of significance, we will release it. That is our promise. It doesn't matter what we think. So we had no choice to release it whatsoever. Then there is the general philosophical principle of actually, this is a great historical document. It's a really very, very interesting historical document in how did, over the past 10 years, global warming, how did that become an issue? What were the debates between scientists? It's a really, really important historical document. And later on, the UK, the, the UK papers, which have close involvement with British intelligence, so lots, of, lots of journalists have come out and say how they have secret briefings from British intelligence and that they do each other favours, etc., etc., said that we receive this stuff from the FSB. Just three days they said this before the, internet, uh, before the Copenhagen conference. So my opinion is that probably, not certainly, maybe the papers did it by themselves, but probably UK intelligence tried to frame us as being a conduit for the FSB because actually they didn't like the truth of what was in those emails. Absolutely outrageous. And one detail as well, just because the effect, which is very important, um, when th this was published, at some point in time, the CRU proclaimed that they are misrepresented by this selection of information and that they will <coughs> see into publica publicating um, the rest of the material that they have to correct the picture. So this is essentially something that needs to be triggered by something like this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is uh, the most positive effect you can have from such a publication is that someone says, this is not the full picture, so I'll give you everything that I kept secret before, but I'll publish it now just to make sure that the picture is full and correct. Yeah. So what, what we want people to do is fight with the truth. If people shoot truth at each other, then after the bodies are cleared away, all that remains is the bullets of truth in the historical record, and then we can get somewhere. Thank you very much. It's honesty and thoughtfulness like that, will, which will definitely be seeing me trying to get off your list next year. Thank you. Thanks. Hey. Yeah. Just have one more question, and there's not too much I, time left. Hi. I have a short question. How yes. do you protect the sources? For example, if I would get hold of a secret document, the document could have some stegographic means, for example, page break, for example, wording, so one can track that this document was delivered to me, not to, to somebody else, and maybe then black limousines come to my house and I would be put somewhere, I don't know. Yeah, and, so, so, and so how do you protect the sources? So your, your question is quite important and interesting. So the first grounds is to understand that there's a difference between what happens and what is possible. But everything that is possible will happen to someone. I, I will get to that. But you know, you will, you will lose 2% of your life this year, probably more actually, guaranteed, 100%. <laughs> so let's not be too concerned with things that don't tend to happen in practice. That said, um, we have lost no sources at all whatsoever, in any way, internal investigation, stenography, etc. We do try and remove uh, a whole bunch of different things. We reprocess PDFs, we recompile them, etc. But yes, things may get through. You don't need to go to this complex level that you're talking about. All you need to do is just change one or two words in a document. It's, it's yes. quite, quite easy. Just change one or two words. However, if you've got someone who has to have given you that document individually, a document just for you, that's a really big logistical overhead inside an organization. They have to have already suspected you and, or someone in a group. And then they have to have compiled different versions of a document for everyone in this group. Um, that doesn't tend to happen in practice. And if you suspect that maybe something like that is happening, well, you just take your colleague's document and you leak that. Okay. <laughs> okay. But sometimes, if people are working maybe on projects for government or some stuff, yes. then there's a strict policy who gets which documents yes. and who signs for which documents and stuff like that. Yes. And so um, every document that is given to somebody is um, 
is, is tracked, so you know who gets which document we, and stuff like that. For, for very few organizations that are publishing classified information, we know about some of these techniques and we're taking care that these mechanisms have no effect. So, and up until now this has worked. There are many ways how you can make sure that a document either gets distributed to many, many more people or to let's say alter uh, some of the information on the document to make sure no one knows who it actually came from. So, yeah. and, in, and in the end something that is sometimes done uh, is that you can retype the document but, or just quote selective parts of it. If, if the source is really, really concerned uh, you can just quote particular bits and then you hope that those few pieces that you quoted didn't have the magic word in them. But once again this has never happened to us and we've put out a hell of a lot of stuff. Um, and there's many ways, you know, someone gives documents to a few people, five people, but actually they also give them to the whole computer network. So they give them to many more. They also, there's things thrown in the waste paper basket. Uh, there's a big difference between suspicion and proof. Um, anyway, my answer to you is if any source uh, is saying, oh, well, how do I eliminate this possibility in my particular circumstances, just come to us. We will work out a way through it. Um, we will send out extra copies of the doc get you to send out extra copies of the document internally to make sure it's in many more people's hands as an example. There's always been a way through for the people that we've worked with. Uh, sometimes they can be custom solutions, other times if it's something we've experienced many times uh, in the past then we just we know what to do straight away. Uh, okay. But the important thing is to work through it. If you have some intelligence there is always a way uh, to get it through. Okay, but so if, if, if a source has to approach you, then you could be, a press, uh, could be um, pressable to re reveal the name of the source. No. Because if you have communication with the source, it this communication can yeah. be tracked. It depends on how they approach us. So they can approach us through our encrypt encrypted uh, server over SSL and they can come via Tor as an example. They can send us things in the post, uh, which is a good method if you, if you can't understand the technology enough to understand if it's secure or not. And stuff in this post, you can use a different computer, you can use a different telephone. Um, okay. there's, there's always a way if you care. Always. Is there a how to? to uh, that's to what we are working on, actually. Okay. We are working on the how to and why, le why, no, why and how to leak documents guide that will be provided <laughs> to. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yes. In, in it's inspired by a gentleman in the audience here. Yeah. So uh, the idea is to distribute it to parliamentarians uh, right before they're going on a summer holidays or on the summer break and to make sure to capture that uh, inertia that there is to make something happen. So, okay, but uh, I think we're sort of running out of time. So thanks again for um, the patience and the interest and uh, hope to see you all next year. Enjoy the conference. <laughs>